Anyway, everyone, thanks for uh, coming out tonight. Uh, if you're confused where you are um, and you're just here for the pizza, this is the Richmond AWS User Group, and this is like our like our seventh, sixth or seventh uh, meetup, and we usually do this once a month, um, clustering them either in the spring or the fall. So this is kind of like our spring 2020 season, if you will. And tonight we're going to talk about Jenkins. Um, uh, some guys are here from CloudBees, and CloudBees is kind of the company that uh, is behind the open source project that is Jenkins, and, uh, and they'll explain that in more detail. But um, after that, uh, um, we're going to hear uh, from um, Eric, who's going to talk about the uh, latest updates to the AWS platform, of which there are many, 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 and he's going to cover the most interesting ones. He actually works at AWS but will not be speaking on behalf of AWS. He will be speaking on behalf of Eric. Um, and so, really quick, um, time for our raffle. So, I... This is me writing my Python scripts, totally over-engineered, to, um, to do a, a raffle based on whoever RSVPs. So, um, we'll see how this works. Can you guys see my screen? Okay, sorry, it's at the bottom. Let me see if this changes it. There we go. Okay, so here we go. This is going to be really cool. Is this person in the house? No? Shame on you, sir. Let's try again. Damn. <laughs> All right. Well, let's try again. Is this person in the house? Yes. Yes. You win $250 of AWS credit. And that applause could also be for my amazing Python script that shoots a photo up. I'm very proud about that, that it, that it worked. Got really nervous there when that guy showed up twice. <laughs> he's, a, he's a lucky man. Uh, so the card is somewhere. I'll, I probably should give it to you right now. What's your name? Christina. Christina. All right. Well, send the live away. Um, uh, um, so make sure you don't leave your um, PDF volume up. There's your, yeah. Honestly, I, I've lost money, my own, my own money, that way, by accident, on, on free tier. Anyway, yeah, uh, so, uh, and we'll do that every time. AWS uh, just keeps sending these to, to us, so we love giving them away. So. Uh, anyway, oh, do, do you guys, have you seen Minority Report? Remember how, like, the, the ball drops down and then it, like, so that's, um, instead of Sarah, um, it was, her name. Uh, so anyway, thank you to CloudBeast for coming here and talking to us about Jenkins. And thank you to Epon for hosting the event. Thank you to AWS for uh, funding the raffle. And thanks to you guys for coming out. Um, I know this sounds kind of hokey, but... Uh, People coming out to these events and getting together and talking about technology is super important, and um, I uh, I think it makes Richmond a better place to live uh, when we have this kind of synergy, um, and uh, and it's fun to like share uh, stuff that we do every day, <laughs> um, because uh, um, yeah. So uh, and then this is an exciting little announcement. So Manchester and Bang Bangalore and Melbourne all have these cool community days. Uh, and so I thought, why not do one for Richmond? So we're going to be doing, I stole San Francisco's logo um, and replace them with Richmond. So hopefully they're cool with that. But we're going to be doing one on August 28th in, uh, this summer. And uh, it's going to be an all-day event. And we're going to have two tracks, advanced and beginner, like 101 and 201. And we're going to have people from AWS coming here and doing workshops for serverless and for machine learning. And um, 
and we're gonna have like uh, a panel discussion. We're gonna have free food trucks, free T-shirts, um, other free random swag, and uh, like a coffee social, and then a happy hour across the street, uh, Star Hill. And actually, uh, Cloud Beats is gonna be the the venue, the second venue for the the second track. So uh, we're gonna block off Lee Street, um, and um, and uh, have people migrating to, from these two buildings for the, the different tracks. Um, and uh, it should be a lot of fun. And we're gonna, uh, again, we're gonna have Robert Half is sponsoring like three or four food trucks coming um, that we can obviously, that are gonna be included in the, and this is a free event by the way. So um, uh, yeah, and then we'll, we'll have like discount beers at Star Hill afterwards. Um, and uh, it's just gonna be a lot of fun and a lot of awesome minds. Uh, gather in the same place to talk about AWS. So I'm really excited about it. Um, it's uh, I'm just now able to say the date and that it's um, that it's for it's for real going to happen. <laughs> Everyone's bought in. So um, I'll uh, stay po mark your calendars and I'll be providing more info later. So without further ado, um, I give you Matt Elgin, everyone, and he's gonna. Uh, School us up. Awesome. Well, thank you. Um, so I will go ahead and jump right into it. Um, so my name is Matt Elgin. I'm a solutions architect with uh, CloudVees right across the street. Um, so today I wanted to talk a little bit about um, Jenkins and AWS and best practices um, around using that tool in AWS. So, quick rundown of the agenda for um, today's discussion. Um, first, I want to start um, high level, just a quick introduction to what Jenkins is. Um, I want to talk through um, different deployment options for um, Jenkins in AWS. So, looking at the different services, what makes the most sense from an infrastructure perspective. Um, from there, we'll talk about best practices for Jenkins in AWS, both from a architecture perspective and also uh, integration points. Um, We'll then talk about um, streamlining deployments with Jenkins into AWS um, using a feature called IAM roles for service accounts. Uh, we'll do a quick demo of, of that showing a Hello World example. Um, I've got Q&A at the end here, but um, definitely want this to be a discussion. So if anybody has questions or comments throughout, feel free to jump in, raise your hand. Anyway. So let's start with the intro to Jenkins, but before I dive into that, just Quick show of hands, how many people in the room use Jenkins today or have used Jenkins? Okay, awesome, so a good number are familiar. Um, so quick recap or, or intro for those who aren't familiar. So um, Jenkins is an open source automation server. Um, it's used to automate both CI and CD um, through um, a handful of different job types, namely uh, what we call Jenkins pipelines. Um, one of the um, huge benefits of the tool is the, the very active community that's behind it. So um, it's very flexible. Um, I actually just updated this, this count of the plugins, but we're at 1,700 plus plugins for all kinds of different tools. Um, anything you're going to encounter in that, um, that DevOps tool chain, there's probably a, a plugin written for Jenkins. Um, huge user base, so 200,000 installs, um, 2 million users, 20 million jobs. Um, continuing to grow there as well. So again, huge, uh, strong community that's behind this tool. So as I mentioned, there are a ton of plugins, um, lots of different integration points for pretty much any tool you're gonna encounter um, across the SDLC. So anything from your uh, code commit, um, your build, your test, your scans, um, different deployment tools. Um, Jenkins can sit as that central orchestrator that handles the automation of all of those pieces and, and uh, brings them all into a centralized process. So that can also include the AWS ecosystem. So um, this was what came up when I did uh, just a quick search of AWS on the plugins.jenkins.io uh, website. So this is just a subset of the, the numerous different uh, options for integrating um, AWS services with Jenkins. So Definitely powerable, definitely flexible, but there's a lot to navigate. Um, it can be tough to figure out 
what plugin do I reach for to integrate with X service in AWS? Which one's the you know most installed, most recently maintained, that sort of thing. Um, another decision point that um, organizations run into when uh, working with Jenkins in AWS is um, how do I deploy Jenkins itself? So there are different options in terms of do I run it on EC2, on ETS, on EKS? Um, some combination of those for the masters and agents. Um, what makes the most sense for my particular use case? What are the, the pros and cons there? Um, so that can be a lot to navigate and something I want to talk about a little bit up front on how different factors can, can impact that decision point. <coughs> so let's dive into some of the pros and cons considerations for um, Jenkins using these different uh, AWS infrastructure uh, services. Um, so let's start with um, probably the first choice that a lot of organizations would reach for, so that's Jenkins on EC2. Um, so some of the benefits of Jenkins on EC2 um, is mainly the, the ease of use. So it's easy to get up and running. There's uh, plenty of documentation online for that particular use case. Um, the management and maintenance once you um, do that install is uh, fairly straightforward going forward to uh, keep up with that uh, that uh, administration, um, and if you're moving from a more traditional, um, you know, uh, on-premise data center type installation of Jenkins, moving that to EC2 is a fairly uh, straightforward learning curve. Um, some of the drawbacks compared to the, the other platforms we'll be looking at, um, there's not necessarily an out-of-the-box um, resilience or self-healing capability like you'll get with um, some of the other platforms we'll look at. Um, the other thing is that the Obviously, by definition, your uh, agents, your resources are running as VMs rather than containers. Um, so from a CI CD perspective, that can be uh, less scalable, can introduce some additional um, overhead that you wouldn't necessarily have running on some of these other containerized platforms. So that brings us to option two, which is Jenkins on ECS. Um, so some of the pros here, um, so it it's relatively easy to use. Um, there's integration with Fargate, so if you want to kind of extract away that um, dealing with the infrastructure directly, you don't want to have to worry about that. You can uh, opt for the Fargate option and not have to worry about that um, infrastructure level. Um, there's obviously a tight integration with um, other pieces of the AWS ecosystem, so that makes interacting within the world of AWS that much easier. Um, and obviously, by definition, you are leveraging the benefits of uh, containerized agents, which is something we'll talk about a little bit more as a, a best practice in a little bit. Um, some of the things to consider when you're uh, looking at Jenkins on ECS, um, in large part stem from um, thinking about um, having a multi-cloud strategy and being um, all in on AWS, so it is pr proprietary tooling. Um, there's uh, less of a uh, ecosystem for third-party integrations than there might be with um, some of the other options. Um, and if for some reason you're looking at porting out to, um, you know, um, on-premise or uh, other cloud providers, it might not be as, uh, as straightforward. If you could do like a hybrid cloud model um, and deploy it with, like, um, with uh, Jenkins on EC2, you could just install Jenkins on these servers that are on-prem Stuff with Jenkins and then your EC2 stuff with Jenkins and manage them from the same. Like, could you do that with option one? So basically, have your your master running as an EC2 instance, and then having your your agents that are actually executing the workload as as containers in a different service. Am I understanding correctly? Maybe. I mean, I guess is the option one like lend itself to hybrid cloud. I, I think what you're, I think what you're saying is if you wherever your master is, you talk maybe some two years running back to your your link up into the AWS environment, you have your agents sitting up there. On a different server, and that way you can orchestrate your pipeline to the AWS deployments only from that agent in the AWS environment, and then you can orchestrate a different pipeline to your on site. I, I, is, that, is that what you're going Yeah, kind of, but ETS, you wouldn't be able to do that, it sounds like, because it's proprietary to one instance. Right, so if you're, you're considering more of that the hybrid approach, then it might make sense to look at the, the other um, platforms there. And I'll, I'll skip ahead. A couple slides, so I think it, it's kind of getting at this point. But um, one option that we do definitely see out in the wild is the, the combination of some of these, um, both some of these AWS services and also other cloud providers um, on premise. 
um, pieces of the, the Jenkins infrastructure. So you can definitely have a Jenkins master that runs on um, EC2, for example, that's calling out to either you know ECS, EKS, or some entirely separate cloud somewhere on prem, and, and you know kind of mix and match there. So jumping back to um, the third option, and kind of finishing um, the evaluation of these uh, these three services here, um, we want to look at Jenkins on. Uh, EKS, so on Kubernetes. Um, so the, the pros here really stem from um, harnessing the power of Kubernetes as a platform and the kind of industry momentum and the, the community that's built up around that platform. Um, so again, that portability is a little bit more straightforward when we're talking about uh, Kubernetes-based installs, master agents, that sort of thing. Um, there's also um, integration with Fargate, so that's kind of uh, increasing that, that parity um, from a serverless perspective. Um, and you also get um, some benefits of containerizing those, those workloads from a Jenkins perspective. So your masters become self-healing and resilient with their you know, stateful sets as uh, within Kubernetes they spin immediately back up. Um, you get the benefit of dynamic uh, ephemeral agents that are spinning up and down dyna dynamically for your um, actual pipeline execution. Um, the drawbacks or the things to consider from the EKS perspective is that um, there's definitely a steep learning curve on the Kubernetes side. So um, it can be challenging to get up and running, um, kind of orient with what you've been doing in Jenkins traditionally and porting that over to the world of Kubernetes. Um, it can be overkill in a lot of cases if you're you know, a, a relatively small team or um, are handling kind of a handful of, of more simple applications, it might be um, too much tooling to introduce an entire Kubernetes cluster there. Um, and the last piece is that um, some tools are still getting there to support full containerization and um, having to deal with kind of those legacy tools with the more um, containerized cloud native applications can uh, definitely add complexity that um, you'll have to take into account if you're, you're managing that, that platform. So with that in mind, I um, wanted to dive into um, some best practices for Jenkins. Um, I said on, on EKS here, um, some of these recommendations definitely are specific to um, containerized uh, Jenkins deployments, um, which we definitely recommend whenever possible, but um, other best practices are um, applicable no matter what type of um, uh, deployment model we're uh, looking at here. So the first one I want to discuss is this idea of right side view Jenkins masters. Um, so Jenkins masters tend to work the best when they are scaled for their original purpose, which was automating the workload of an individual team. Um, so we uh, work with lots of organizations that have taken a single Jenkins master and just continued to throw hardware and themes at it. And all of a sudden, it's got thousands of different pipelines. It's got all these different teams with all these different uh, plugins and workload types that are trying to run off the same server. Um, and that can uh, cause a lot of uh, headaches from a stability perspective, from a management perspective. Um, so what we recommend instead is to basically break your masters down into smaller um, team-based masters, um, which allows for more purpose-built um, installations that have only the specific plugins to not, um, you know, every single plugin that your entire development organization is going to need for their entire uh, tool set. Uh, also allows for uh, workload isolation um, across those teams. So if team A is doing something that brings down their Jenkins master, that's going to impact them until it comes back up, but it's not a organization-wide impact like it would be in this monolithic model. Um, finally, you're going to encounter better scalability, um, better performance, um, and more stability. Um, as you start to scale horizontally um, in this model, you're not going to run into some of those, uh, those performance limits that you would get by trying to scale vertically in this, this monolithic model. So moving to the second recommendation um, when you're thinking about um, architecting uh, Jenkins and AWS. Um, 
So this is a uh, architecture diagram I borrowed from our uh, quick start in AWS for our enterprise Jenkins platform. Um, so the things that I want to call out here is basically the separation of your different workload types um, within your node pools. Um, so we've got a node pool for um, the masters themselves, so they're able to um, run separately. They've got some isolation um, and security from the actual uh, agent execution um, for those pipelines. Um, the second node pool that we work with is a regular agent node pool. So basically your um, standard pipeline jobs are going to run um, on these uh, agent nodes, account for kind of that unique scalability there. Um, and again, isolating that impact from the, the master instances. Um, the last node pool is uh, leveraging spot instances. So um, enacting this idea of spot agents. So basically any type of job that can be um, interrupted and it's not gonna uh, have significant impact uh, to the business. Um, there's a lot of cost savings that can be uh, uh, benefited from there uh, by leveraging the spot instances in that node pool. Can I ask a question about that one? Yeah. So the users there, those are like users that, is it like applications making requests or is that like um, users logging into the console at key buttons and then pass through the, the load balancer? So in this case, those users would be um, the actual users that are logging into the, the Jenkins interface. So um, yeah, so interacting with the actual UI building pipelines, that sort of thing. The third uh, best practice that I wanted to touch on um, is how you think about um, constructing your uh, agents um, within a containerized environment, but, but really um, across the board, no matter what uh, infrastructure type is, is being used. Um, so um, first of all, we do recommend containerized agents whenever possible. Um, so there are many benefits that can be um, reaped from that. Um, so you get the ephemeral nature of um, agents spinning up and spinning down, um, which is a significant improvement from the legacy uh, approach where you've got static VMs or servers that are sitting there waiting for a job to execute. Um, they're also um, more repeatable. So rather than having to make sure that the uh, tools and all the configuration on your agent machines are consistent from uh, from build execution to build execution. Um, if you're building these as containers and as pods in Kubernetes, you um, basically ensure that repeatability by making sure you've got a clean uh, environment that's running uh, consistently from build to build. Um, the second piece of this is that you want your agents to be built for a specific purpose. So we sometimes see an anti-pattern where people will build what we call kitchen sink agents. So just any tool that could be um, called from that pipeline is all on a single agent. And that becomes, again, a, a pretty significant uh, maintenance burden. Um, so we instead recommend that you have your agents do one thing and do that one thing well. So you've got specific tool that's installed that can be called um, from those pipelines. So that's going to scale out better. It's also going to promote the use of uh, parallel tasks in your pipeline. So if you want to um, concurrently execute things and cut down over execu overall execution time, um, that's going to greatly um, uh, help that, uh, that effort. Um, so the example diagram here, we'll, we'll dive into in a little bit more detail in the demo. Um, but basically, we've got a container that's got the AWS CLI that allows us to interact with um, different AWS services from that, that Jenkins agent. And the last best practice that I wanted to touch on, um, which can sometimes be a controversial one, is the idea that you don't always need another plugin. Um, so I know that I was just, um, you know, talking about the, the huge plugin count that's out there for Jenkins today and all that extensibility. Um, but sometimes that can be taken to the other extreme where all of a sudden um, every integration point becomes another plugin installed on that master. And that can, again, turn into issues with maintenance, with stability. Um, you're increasing your um, you know, risk of security vulnerabilities from those different plugins that are being installed. Um, the other thing to keep in mind is that there are lots of 
great plugins out there that have their place in pretty much every Django installation. Um, but there are plenty of others that are no longer uh, actively maintained or they're not following plugin best practices. Um, so you have to really do some research and understand what you're installing before you can put out a plugin. So the alternative approach that I'll propose here is rather than reaching for a plugin for every single integration point in your Jenkins pipeline, is to uh, leverage basically that agent architecture that we just talked about. So um, containerized agents that are built for one thing and one thing well, um, basically having your tool that you need to call um, installed on that agent container and then called directly from the pipeline. Um, so in this example, we'll be talking about calling the AWS CLI directly. Um, and this is a segue into the, the next topic that we're gonna uh, kind of segue into the demo. Um, but one way that you can securely interact with uh, AWS resources from these pipelines is with this feature called IAM roles for service accounts. Questions, comments so far? So one question on the plugins. Uh -huh. uh, uh, many applications I've seen using part of this Docker, and is that an issue with the performance or the security of the things from the plugin? You want the Docker as a stretch, right? But through the pipeline, not through the build and deployment pipeline. But if you want to provision the infrastructure through that, uh, we have the different plugins available. But are we recommending that? How do we provide some alternatives for our Docker? So the question is specifically about keeping this recommendation in mind while also thinking about things like the Docker plugin that's mm -hmm. handling that infrastructure provisioning. Yeah, um, it's a good point, and, and I think it goes back to, I'm certainly not saying that all plugins are, are evil and you know you need to be running a Jenkins master with nothing installed. Um, so obviously you're gonna be using the critical uh, plugins that have been well tested and are installed across lots of different um, uh, organizations. So the Docker plugin is a good example, the Kubernetes plugin, or you know the Git plugin are things you're using to interact with source code things that are kind of that fundamental level um, integration that, that make up the base of your pipeline, um, those are certainly going to be installed. Right? So it, it's not so much to um, eliminate all use of plugins, but more to just consider the, the pros and cons when you're looking at integrating a new tool. Does it make more sense to reach for a plugin versus just integrate directly with the agent? So what we're seeing, uh, uh, all the other majority of the clients that Are they uh, clients reinstalling the plugins? Heavy duty dependent on the plugins uh, versus uh, handling through the, the different architecture? Yeah, so it's kind of a mix, to be honest. Um, there are, are plenty of organizations that we work with that have a huge list of plugins that you know um, can start to be. Uh, unwieldy and, and cause management issues if you uh, all got that installed on a single master. Um, so the, the idea there is to um, either look at kind of separating out those those larger masters into smaller team masters because that means generally if you're separating by you know the technology stack, the, the tools that are being integrated, then you're going to have a smaller plug-in footprint on each one of those masters. So that, that kind of goes in, in parallel um, with this idea of, of kind of when you need to install. But, but it's definitely a, a mix with companies we work with. Some, this is more of an ideal than what we see, you know, every day with people we're working with. Yeah, so I understand the merits of containerizing agents, but why would you pick EKS or CS? You know, why one of those will be great, why one of those are Yeah, so I think, <coughs> The reason that we uh, tend to reach for AKS, or sorry, EKS, is uh, um, primarily kind of the momentum behind Kubernetes as a project and kind of, you know, opting for the, the uh, direction that the industry is going as a whole and, and being able to tap into the different tooling that's being built around that, um, that ecosystem. Um, but it, it, certainly not to say that, that ECS isn't a good uh, choice as well, but I, I think um, we tend to opt for for the um, the Kubernetes distributions for for those reasons.
We have two editions, but I think many are placed in only three pages. It's just came out again in Progress of Six last year in June. And also the number of tasks per time is 750 word words. There's no limit on the time limit of that. So this year it was just one. Right, right. And yeah, and to that point, the, the desire to be cloud agnostic is a, a big driver that we see working with. Um, with our limitation on the task and you know how you handle it during the course of this. Right. Do, do people join using the ECS uh, orchestration for Jenkins to deploy like something that's not ECS or vice versa? Like do people sometimes say, okay, I want to use EKS, uh, Jenkins EKS for my my build pipelines, mm -hmm. but I, I want to deploy to I but I run everything else in the ECS. Like, is, it, is there any sort of trend there? So that would be kind of mixing both of those platforms for different specific use cases from a pipeline perspective. Yeah. But I would suggest to separate build pipeline and the deployment pipeline is two very different two different things. So so you're saying if you get if you're using ECS for your your, your applications right now, you should probably use ECS for Jenkins. Yeah, like the recommendation. Does that make a difference? Well, yeah, I think there is a difference because you know, there's, there's a difference in ECS between the um, implementation of ECS versus the full scope of the deployment. So I think you're, whatever your current cost is and your current deployment, that's really where you want to. There's going to be the most cost benefit. That's that's why there are two options of how you want to manage your deployment. Right now, the most benefit is probably going to you know, be more flexible than anything else. Right. Right. Yeah, I think that's a good rule of thumb is that, you know, if we're talking about, um, you know, kind of greenfield applications, then it might make sense to go to the drawing board and kind of look at these pros and cons. But a big impact is certainly kind of the, the level of investment in the, the particular um, platform and, and, you know, how that integrates with the, the rest of the tool chain. Yeah, because before you probably couldn't set it up either way. But then you're talking about maintaining two different skills, two different skill sets. That individual who has both of those skill sets, what happens when they leave the organization? Do they transfer them to the cloud? Yep. Yeah, that's a good point. So, where I work, uh, we were on EKS and now we're transitioning back to ECS because we thought that our apps aren't as complicated to um, be on EKS. Okay. So, I think the trend is either way based on your ap applications. <laughs> It's not just that EKS is what's next, and people are going to EKS. People are also going the other way, or we're just behind in that trend. We're going the opposite way. <laughs> so yeah. So one important clarification I should make is that 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 kind of uh, platform analysis is specifically talking about about running Jenkins on that platform and kind of the the support there. So. Um, that's certainly not to say that, you know, if Jenkins is running on EKS or ECS, that the rest of the applications that are actually being deployed and built and tested and all that have to mirror that that platform. But from kind of the the best practice for your CI C D platform, um, it, that's kind of what this um, this exercise is getting at. Does that make sense? Cool. Um, so in this last section, I wanted to um, dive a little bit into this specific um, feature um, as a way that we've kind of found as a um, best practice when we're doing um, deployments and interaction from uh, Jenkins to other AWS services. Um, so basically what this IAM roles for service accounts uh, feature does is allows you to uh, securely associate a uh, service account in Kubernetes with a specific uh, IAM role. Um, so basically allows you to tie those permissions that you need to interact with those um, various services um, directly from your, uh, your Kubernetes cluster in Jenkins. Um, so this is an improvement on what was out there for a number of reasons. So there were third party tools that approximated this before it was kind of productized by AWS. Um, 
So it gets rid of the need for both uh, those long lived credentials um, for service accounts, um, eliminates the need to store access keys directly as credentials within banking. Um, and the, the general takeaway is that this is much closer to a uh, practice of least privilege than it would be the traditional way, which is basically um, all of your containerized agents are inheriting that, uh, that worker node IAM role. So being able to scope down those permissions um, much more granularly than, than otherwise. So in practice, um, so actually throwing a little bit of code up on the screen, so it's a pretty straightforward process. So basically you enable that, uh, that particular feature, the IAM roles for service accounts uh, for that cluster. Um, you create a uh, policy that's got the correct permissions um, within the management console. So for example, access to a particular S3 bucket. Um, and then you create the role and associate that with the Kubernetes service account. Um, so what that means is whenever you are running a Jenkins agent that uh, is running as that particular service account, the Jenkins service account, for example, um, it will automatically inherit the uh, permissions from that IAM role. Um, and be able to reach out to the S3 bucket or whatever uh, other um, examples you want to reach out to. So moving the focus one level more into the Jenkins pipeline realm. Um, for, so for those of you that are not familiar with um, what Jenkins pipelines look like, so basically what this is running through is just the code that's defining, um, first of all, I'm defining this is the agent that I want to run this this particular pipeline on. So in this case, we're spinning up a Kubernetes agent um, that is based on a uh, Docker image that has the AWS CLI installed, um, called out in red here, um, kind of the, the key um, tie-in here is running as that service account uh, Jenkins right there. So that's associated with those IAM permissions. Um, and then the actual execution of the steps is fairly straightforward. We are uh, within that container just calling the, um, the AWS CLI to uh, copy up a, um, a file into that S3 bucket. Um, so this is a very trivial uh, kind of hello world type example that I'll walk through. But the idea here is that you can tailor that, that command you're calling from the pipeline as well as the IAM policies to call whatever um, service you need within that AWS ecosystem directly from Jenkins. So with that in mind, um, I'm going to click over to my Jenkins instance. Um, is that, is the size all right? Can everybody read that? Or should I zoom in? Cool. Um, so again, that is that, uh, zoom in again. The Jenkins file that I was just running through. Um, so basically spinning up that uh, Kubernetes pod for our agent and then uh, deploying with AWS uh, CLI. Um, so we'll go back here. Whoops, we'll go to build our branch. Um, we need to give it the bucket we're trying to deploy to um, as a parameter. And before I actually run that, so this is the, uh, the website that we're working with. So again, very much hello world. Um, but the idea is that as we execute this, this build number is going to um, update based on the, the build ID in Jenkins. So we'll run. Give it a second to spin up. Here's our actual execution. So we see that it succeeded, and then we should refresh this and see that we've got an updated build number. Um, so again, trivial example, but the idea is that you're able to securely call those AWS services from your uh, Jenkins agent without having to deal with downloading credentials or uh, setting up credentials within, within Jenkins or environment variables or anything like that. So um, that's all I had from the uh, presentation and demo perspective. Um, so I have a, a link 
list here that I'll uh, share when I send out the, the, the slides and share that afterwards, but just kind of some further reading on some of the topics that were touched on, so things like uh, evaluating services, um, thinking about plugins um, within Jenkins, um, some additional resources as well. Um, so with that, thank you very much for, for your participation and listening, and uh, any questions, I'll, I'll take those. Yeah, good question. So the idea is that basically the the pipeline should be treated as code and is, is stored in that, that source repo as well. Um, so that uh, that actual execution flow gets gets handled as part of that, that Jenkins file script. And then in terms of the um, kind of the infrastructure, the the environment, the agent that that's running on, um, Increasingly, that, that's starting to trend towards being managed as code as well, whenever possible. So um, whether that's a, a Docker image or a Kubernetes pod that can be defined in line or read in from a YAML file. So um, that's either something that can be you know, owned by the development teams or kind of owned uh, jointly with the uh, shared services team that's responsible for those, um, those types of um, kind of resources and infrastructure type stuff. Um, and, and then in terms of kind of enabling the ongoing development and sharing of best practices. There are um, other concepts like uh, shared libraries that allow you to share common uh, you know, pieces of code and, and custom steps and things like that across your different pipelines. So um, what you find is a lot of organizations that are you know, full in Jenkins shops have a pretty robust um, kind of uh, set of tooling built on top of the, the actual pipelines themselves that allow them to, to either kind of reuse those best practices or abstract away some of that complexity from implementation to implementation. Yeah, absolutely. That, that's a great point. It, it's a common pain point that we hear talking to the organizations. Um, and that actually veers a little bit into that the enterprise platform that um, I mentioned earlier. So there's CloudBees Core is basically the enterprise layer that's built around open source Jenkins. So um, when you start thinking about kind of the enterprise level concerns, like how do I enforce the governance and compliance, like how do I bake in making sure there are certain, you know, steps, certain security scans, for example, that are always taking place even if developers are handling certain aspects of that that uh, pipeline script. Um, that's generally when people start talking about the enterprise version. Yeah. Uh, you talked about integrating script design concept. Have you seen any customers that are really trying to do Active Directory and AWS Active Directory service to integrate their entire development pipeline and then manage it through, uh, it's not Active Directory, but uh, identity management tools? Hmm. Um, it's not something that I've personally run into. Is that something that you could see would would make well, sense in that application? It, so when I, um, not, not my current position, but my previous job, there was a lot of um, interest from customers who wanted to, they were using Active Directory as their identity management control, mm -hmm. or anyone who came in through that, and they were using that, they put all their tokens and everything through that. Um, so there was an interest in, in expanding out into the cloud, but how to integrate the existing 
that have been managing schools into private schools. Mm -hmm. Also, extend that into the public sector so that you have fewer standalone accounts and then possibly have to pay tax on the same thing. Okay, got it. Um, yeah, it, it's honestly not something that I've, I've encountered too much. It might be kind of outside of the scope of the typical conversations that, that we have. We certainly talk about that sort of integration when we're talking about the actual Jenkins login and that, that sort of thing. But in terms of kind of the direct integration of the IAM roles and that sort of thing, it's, it's not so much something we encounter all that often. Great. For someone who would want to like get Yeah, so ba basically what's the easiest way to get up and running with a sandbox to play around and learn and that sort of thing? Um, yeah, so it, again, going back to the um, the different deployment options just in AWS, there are, there are lots of different ways that you can get it spun up and kind of uh, get up and running. So um, there is obviously the open source Jenkins out there that's available to download and install as, you know, as a... Uh, a war file or a you know a package for the OS or Docker container or whatever the the target um, infrastructure might be. Um, there's also we have a, a cloud beans distribution that is um, free as well and is basically the open source distribution just wrapped with a couple of additional features and released on kind of a more regular cadence. Um, so I would say either one of those and. From there, there's there's lots of resources on either the, the CloudBees website. So there's a CloudBees university, university that has some free resources on getting started with Jenkins, getting started with writing pipelines, that sort of thing, um, as well as resources on the actual Jenkins website, too. You could, yeah. Yeah, yeah, de definitely from like a, a sandbox getting started perspective. Yeah, there's no issue with that. Going back, I know a little late, but I think you answered this earlier. Going back to your uh, cloud is more development or more. Mm -hmm. So, on some of you guys' security scans and stages, how do you, I guess, have, say, a development team that goes from the GitHub over to Source Retreat? How does the cloud mm -hmm. teams um, square that, bring that square that culture with the dev team? Let's say they're not using GitHub over to Source Retreat, they're like, we're using. Yeah, um, so one of the ways that that um, kind of compliance or governance piece is enforced, um, so let me go back to the, so looking at this pipeline script as an example, um, so one of the ways that you would approach that in the, the enterprise platform is uh, through a pipeline template, um, which is basically just that same um, type of pipeline script, but um, it's set up as a, a template rather than um, having developers have free reign for authoring the whole thing. So what that would look like on their end is they're able to um, manipulate certain parameters within that um, within that pipeline, but not the entire flow of the logic or which uh, systems are being integrated with or the you know the particular steps. Um, so the the idea is that you want to make it as low friction as possible um, from the development side of things, but also um, provide some some ways to enforce consistency on the um, kind of the Jenkins side of things. So what is this template stored essentially? Is it stored inside of Jenkins or cloud bees and Jenkins? The the pipeline itself. Yeah. So that yeah, so the, the best practice is that this script would be in, in source control somewhere. So, so GitHub or whatever that, that tool of choice is. Um, it would also be, there'd be a mapped configuration for the, the pipeline on Jenkins itself. So the, the actual definition of the 
the script is going to live in source control, but um, you're kind of managing the, um, the time of that back to, to Denton from the um, preview app itself. Awesome. Well, if there aren't any other questions, then again, thanks everybody very much. Too. I do these um, uh, and put them on uh, demayo.com. So I, I, I'll do a recording of this and put it on there. And um, I'll, I'll post it on the beat up channel thing too. Um, so you guys can uh, can refresh that. But I might just take the video from the YouTube recording. It. So um, either way, we're going to put this online so you guys can access it later or send it to your coworkers. Well, there's going to be evidence. Well, there's evidence. <laughs> All right, so uh, what's new on AWS? This is for the February 12th through March 3rd period. Uh, there were approximately 89 press releases for new services, new features. Um, all of this came out of the aws.amazon.com about AWS, what's new URL. Uh, when you hit the page, it'll be like that, and then you can go in and start exploring it by category by date with release. So uh, there's three pages of this. Uh, we're gonna the ones that are highlighted are the ones I'm gonna go into a little bit of detail. But it goes everything from cloud formation updates to uh, service expansion into different regions, uh, API support, uh, feature supports, security updates, and even new courses that are gonna be out. Now the uh, the ones I picked were things I thought people. Uh, since we're kind of a heavily financial town, that the <laughs> banking, HIPAA, that type of bit, right? So first one, um, CloudFormation stack sets, right? So they've auto, they've uh, set up automatic deployments across accounts and regions if you have uh, use AWS organizations. So with that, you can, using the organizations, you can now centrally manage your uh, stack set deployments. And then you can also enable uh, automatic deployments across new accounts when you add them into your OUs. Also, uh, another one I thought was interesting was the Amazon ECS, uh, they're now optimizing the Linux 2 AMIs, and they're going to come pre-installed with the System Manager agent, so that's something that you don't have to manually do any longer. Uh, also, you can, uh, but one thing, uh, kind of a gotcha, when you do that, you have to make sure you have the explicit IM assignment right if you're not using admin startup access. But, uh, there are just two different IAM permissions that have to be given to that to get uh, access into the system manager, uh, system manager client. So uh, also, we've uh, received new, uh, you can now receive notifications about pull requests from your code commit. Uh, so whenever a code commit is approved, rejected, or whenever there's, it's been overridden, you can now get automatic uh, notifications of that instead of having to go into code commit and look it up yourself or generating your own uh, SMS for that. New uh, quick start deploys uh, are compliant with the IRAP protected reference architecture. So anyone who's using the information security registered assessors program, uh, that now is, we are now compliant with that, or AWS is now compliant with that. So you can use that to create cloud-based workloads. Uh, this also is not germane to us in Richmond, but uh, it complies with the Australian Cybersecurity Center uh, requirements. Is that all AWS products or is that products? Uh, this is for uh, commercial cloud, not gov cloud. Uh, so the commercial cloud, because we don't have gov cloud outside of the United States, so this is really probably a bigger benefit for foreign countries or regions that are outside the United States, because this can give you that type of security compliance for government regulation, where if or if you don't want to pay for that the gov, gov cloud premium. Uh, plus, there's certain services that are not available in gov cloud. Gov cloud, so. If you want to get to the, some of the services, you can now run at least to this level of security outside of GovCloud. Can you briefly explain what Quick Start is? Some people think it's a free template. Can you explain about it? Uh, quick Start is just a set of, of pre done templates that you would have to customize. That'll just get you up and running within. It's, a, we, it's pitched as it'll get you up and running on a particular service within 60 minutes. So, uh, but that's using. That's using the pre-canned templates, and that's assuming that you don't have any real custom 
too much customization uh, within your own environment, which, as we know, that's going to be very hard to do. So I don't know, in practicality, unless you're starting fresh, I don't know how useful Quick Start is uh, in most uh, most situations, because you once you start dealing with existing infrastructure and legacy pieces, I'm not sure how. I haven't used Quick Start myself, so I'm not sure how well how flexible it is when it comes into that piece. Uh, AWS Firewall Manager is now supported in CloudFormation. So as anyone who's used CloudFormation, you probably realize not all services are fully realized in CloudFormation deployment. So you have to do some extra Lambda or something else to get those extra services in. But now uh, you can do uh, Firewall Firewall Manager, which means that you can do WAF, Shield Advanced, and Security Groups within a single stack template. So and you can do uh, stack updates to update your firewall across the board as well without having to do any token retrievals and making extra API calls. Also, directory services enhance. Uh, this is why uh, I always ask them is this AD was on my mind. There is now, um, the AWS directory services can integrate with secure LDAP. So you have two different aspects. You have the client side LDAP signing, which will allow you to uh, verify data integrity when there's a verification call. And then also the client side LDAP which will now do data integrity plus confidentiality whenever it's making that pull off. So there's just an extra layer that you can implement. Amazon Pinpoint has achieved HIPAA eligibility for SMS. So now uh, you can use Pinpoint to send SMS message messages that contain HIPAA information or personal uh, protected health information. This is uh, for any region that Pinpoint is now available in. I didn't get the list of which region Pinpoint is, but you can look, you can Google that. Uh, and so this will allow Pinpoint to help with any HIPAA uh, eligible workloads. So what is Pinpoint? Hmm? Pinpoint? Uh, uh, Pinpoint is part of the uh, uh, messaging uh, channel, so it integrates with SMS so that you can send well, so you can send data to your target client. Uh, so. I'm, I'm not sure what the actual uh, active implementation for that would be, but I'm assuming in a health environment you could, now you can send messages to doctors and nurses inside the hospital or caregivers could potentially set up an app, they could develop an app that would use Pinpoint to deliver confidential information to uh, customers or to patients. Because as you know, SMS by nature is not a secure protocol since it's uh, just easily intercepted. Amazon Manage uh, Cassandra services. Now, you are now able to, we, that was just announced at reInvent, uh, the integration with Amazon, with Cassandra, with Amazon services. So with now Cassandra, you now have the ability to optimize price throughput by setting uh, price triggers within your workloads. So based off read write cap uh, cap uh, capacity, you can pre-provision that, which will then control your cost. When you hit that provision limit, it'll uh, put a halt to it so you don't run out of control. Uh, probably an excellent in a sandbox or in a uh, dev environment where you don't want to go past a certain threshold for uh, your development. You can also, um, and you can manage all of this through the Cassandra query language. Uh, there's also been a new release of the Solutions Architect course. Uh, Examver, if you're looking it up, anyone's going to take the associate. Uh, it's SAAC02. Uh, so uh, SAC01 is still going to be available until March 22nd of this year. And then, but SAAC02 is available now, uh, it, but it will be the only thing that will be available after March 23rd. So if you've been studying for the first, the previous test, I'm going to take it before March 22nd, if you can. Uh, otherwise, <laughs> you might need to, uh, you might need to look out for the updated practice test and the updated learning paths for that, to see what those changes are. Quick question about the ramp up guide. Mm -hmm. I just started using them. Is that something that you just started, or is it, has it been that since the first session? I so I, they, there's always been a ramp up guide type uh, mm -hmm. uh, document that's been available, but I believe this is a new version of that. They ha I haven't uh, developed one of these ramp up guides, uh, so the, I've been I've been working on the DevOps engineering in AWS and the SysOps. Uh, instructor led training courses, and we haven't developed a ramp up guide for either one of those yet. So, I'm, I do architecture is being you know, handled by a different teams, so this may be something new or a new version of what they're doing for that. Okay. 
I don't have any direct knowledge of that. Uh, AWS Level Accelerator will now support bring your own IP. So, for anybody who has invested a lot of time configuring their network based off their own IP space, you can now bring that on up and uh, hard code that into the AWS environment. Uh, so you can extend when you're in the hybrid environment, you can extend your local traditional infrastructure up into the AWS environment without having to do a lot of that translation and all the things that come along with that. Uh, this is also set up to uh, uh, certain countries have special registrations for this type of piece. So this will give you regulatory compliance regards. But also there's a uh, use case I think where if you already have clients that are set up that are hitting certain particular uh, access points via hard-coded IP, now you could just extend those hard-coded those IPs up into the AWS environment so you don't have to redeploy all your clients and do client updates. At least not initially. Amazon Managed Cassandra Service, another update to that is that now you can use uh, from within AWS the alter table uh, command within the query language to modify existing uh, tables within AWS Cassandra implementation. So before you had to use that through your management console, but now you can uh, just use the query language like you could with normal Cassandra. Uh, AWS X-Ray is now available in GovCloud. So anyone who is working in GovCloud, as you know, uh, X-Ray has not been available. X-Ray is uh, the tool that Amazon provides to do scans of your, uh, your development workflows and your application to look for security vulnerabilities within your code. So this will can give you that end-to-end -end on how your application is performing and help you troubleshoot performance issues. AWS System Manager now supports private links in GovCloud. So now that you have uh, that access to the private link, so that private link is that end-to-end uh, -end, uh, communication into GovCloud from wherever you're located at. So you can now use System Manager over that. It's now compliant. So that'll give you some extra flexibility and now you can run your uh, interfaces through the same client so you don't actually have to host a client on your local machine just to add some extra uh, security when dealing with your GovCloud systems. There's also uh, the last two, uh, new classroom course, Media Essentials for IT Business Decision Makers. Uh, this is not a super tech course, it's more for the business oriented, uh, the executive. Hmm? <laughs> But it covers media and cloud fundamentals and it will help with creating a cloud migration strategy to move your media workflows into AWS. Uh, it integrates with AWS Media Services, Elemental Media Live, Elemental Media Convert, and Elemental Media Tailor. Please don't ask me exactly what those do, I don't know. Uh, but it will cover security, artificial intelligence, and analytic, analytics concepts to help you with developing those workflows. And then last but not least, but at Lambda Edge, we're now supporting Node 12.x and Python 3.8. So uh, as you know, uh, we uh, have deprecated anything below Node.js 10 and Python 3.7 for the Lambda Edge. So that's still supported, but we now also have the new releases of 12 and 3.8. Lambda Edge and Lambda running on? The Edge caching. Uh, so when, so it's, it's still Lambda, but it allows for faster response time and um, it, uh, it, provides act it, it provides a lower latency and response time because you're not actually getting into the AWS infrastructure, you're staying on the, uh, the edge points. So that um, it's, it's just for providing lower latency and response times to your customers when they're hitting your application. To the best of my knowledge, that's correct. But again, I'm not a. Uh, I haven't used the Lambda Edge, and we haven't. I haven't done any training on that yet, so I couldn't speak to it directly. Yeah. There's probably a chance that some there's some secret sauce in there you can't find. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, no, I just put that down to my ignorance on that. So I'm still, you know, I've only been with Amazon for about a year, so I'm still trying to get myself up to speed on everything. If you were a multi-year 